So this talk is about breaking into cybersecurity. It is more on the career development side of everything rather than any technical development. Uh, for that, we have amazing folks out there like Josh and uh, Neil and other amazing folks creating that sort of content. Um, I wanted to focus more on the career development. Um, so the idea of this talk is going to be focusing on what you want to do, self-discovery, strategic planning, um, building your reputation and network, and getting that next role. So first, let's focus on who you are. Um, oftentimes, the first question I ask folks when they tell me that they want to break into cybersecurity is what they want to do. And that usually stumps them from the beginning. Um, so um, even Paul, when I had this first conversation with him, um, it's like, what are you passionate about? What do you like to do? And you have to figure out that for yourself first. Um, if you don't have a good idea uh, as to what you're looking to do with your career um, and what about that you're very passionate about, it's going to make your job hunting hard. It's going to make networking hard because you won't know who to reach out to. You won't know what sort of roles to look at. You won't know what to research. So first, it's figuring out in yourself like what you're passionate about, what problem that you want to solve. Um, as uh, Simon uh, Sex says, like find your why. Uh, so I always like to start with that. And it's figuring out like where you are now, um, what sort of tech skills you have, what sort of um, personal abilities or soft skills, what sort of functional knowledge. Um, and that comes from all of your work experience. That could be um, if you're in the military, inside the military, outside the military. Um, for example, we have like Paul and Jeremiah here you're setting up foundations and communities and community building like that at just the act of doing that creates a lot of soft skills that you can use to market yourself you can use to um, create new roles that a company might not have considered and place yourself in that role so think of all of those skills as a holistic approach when you're looking into your new career uh, please ensure that you you mute your mic. So perfect. Um, so as we as you start as you figured out who you are, what you want to do, now it's time to start looking. Um, oftentimes, when you look at a job description, you're going to list these three things: experience, um, education, and certifications. If you've Never heard my rant on that. Um, experience is always going to win, um, but there's many different ways that you can get experience. You could get experience on the job, you can get experience yourself, um, and then you could get experience through volunteering. Um, so if, if you have not had any formal hey, experience on the job, um, you can work to, to help out communities, you can work to help others um, and get experience in that way. Education. Um, I have a master's, but that doesn't mean that you have to go get a master's. Um, I, companies are working to reduce their requirements for formal education as they've seen how quickly technology is advancing. Um, but there's likely always going to be some sort of educational requirement uh, especially if you're going to continue to work uh, for the government or um, along government type contracts. So that might be something that you need to consider in your overall career planning. Um, could be that there, there's some sort of requirement in the contracting language that you might have to meet. Um, sometimes that's a bachelor's, sometimes that's higher. Just keep that in mind. As for certifications, um, my recommendation when it comes to certification is to start with the end in mind. So plan out your career, potentially what you want to do in the next three to five years, 
um, what sort of role that is, and look at the, the, the types of certification that will be value add to that role and then work your way back. Um, nothing against those individuals that might have collected 15, 20 certifications um, in a short period of time, but that could be a red flag to a hiring manager. Like, do you just have the certifications or do you have the experience that comes with that? Um, I, I recommend targeting just those certifications that are going to help you, that are going to add value to your role. And you can talk to why you chose those certifications, what value you got out of doing those certifications. Um, and then there's just studying for the cert without getting the actual piece of paper. Um, just if, you're, if you don't need an A plus and a network plus, but you want to have that foundational knowledge as to how networks work and how operating systems and computers work, study the material, be able to talk to that. You just don't necessarily need the certification. So my recommendation, look at yourself where you wanna be in five years, start to plan, jot that down. Um, what does that career look like? What kind of role might that be? Um, what education requirements might you need? What sort of skills and competencies that you might need? And then you can work your, your, yourself back. Um, if you've done any sort of project planning, this is like project planning your career. Um, build in milestones for yourself along the way. Maybe you'll get one cert one year and then incrementally build up the complexity until you do that. Um, just, just build it out, easy, achievable milestones. And then that way you, you make progress along the way. Don't, don't forget to think about like your, your, your skills and your competencies. Um, you often wanna focus on what you're good at versus what you're weak at, because oftentimes what you're weak at might not align with what you're passionate about. You could be weak at it simply because um, you don't like it. And you could work really hard at something that you don't like. For example, uh, I don't like coding. I could work really hard at coding and I'll probably never be that good at it. Um, but is that something that I want to invest my time in? That's something you have to decide, right? Are you going to go, am I going to go out and take a coding job? Probably not. Because as hard as I have to work just to be normal or average in that role, I'm, I'm not going to feel fulfilled. So think about your skills and your competencies that way, right? Um, focus on the strengths that you have now, those are also skills and competencies, but then what you want to work at and then build those into your milestones as well. Then work your way backwards. So the reason I say be flexible is because you don't know what's going to happen. You could get married. Um, you could have a kid. Um, there could be a pandemic. Um, you never know what's going to happen, right? So that you have to have that element of flexibility to your career plan, to what you want to do. Um, for me, my five-year goal is that I want to be a CISO. Um, how I get from there to, to uh, from where I am now to a CISO, that could vary. That could change. Uh, it could be in one industry, it could be in another industry. It could be for a small company, it could be for a big company. I don't want to limit myself, um, but I also want to keep myself open to what might happen um, along the way and enjoy it, right? Um, you don't want to be stressed out. You don't want to burn out. So keep that in mind. Track your progress. Create your career plan. Have career ROI. Um, what I mean with that is like, think of the things that you do in your career planning and working towards your goal and make sure that it's, it's returning on investments, uh, on your time invested in that activity. So it could be you sent out a hundred resumes this week, but you spent a hundred hours doing those hundred resumes. If you didn't get any responses for, from those hundred resumes, Think about maybe what you did wrong or uh, what you could have changed, tweak it, maybe try a different approach, try something different, 
tweak that to make sure you're getting the returns that you're looking for, that you're getting those callbacks, that you're getting those interviews, um, or that you're achieving those certifications, whatever it might be, right? Um, I'm right now I'm studying for a SAN certification and part of the study technique is to develop an index. As I'm studying for it, I realize that by creating that index, I'm learning more along the way, trying to create the index that I could use as a cheat sheet. And when I did my practice exam, I never even needed it because I already studied along the way, little milestones that you retain along the way. Now, this is one of the things I stress all the time. And Paul, Peter, the, Jeremiah, these individuals, they know this, they know the value of this, and that's building a great reputation and building a network. Can't stress that enough. Um, cybersecurity is a small world, and they, people talk. You, you might not see it, but there's back channels. There's, there's people that talk. You don't want to have a, a negative reputation. Um, but on that end, you also want to contribute value to the community, right? So um, do good, provide value, connect with individuals. How to connect? There's LinkedIn, there's Twitter, there's Discords, um, there's meetups like this. And pre-COVID pre times, there's physical meetups, there's conferences, things like this. Get to know people in your community, um, not just sending messages behind the screen. Because I think once you have that interaction with the people that you're working with or that you're networking with and they get to know you, there's even more emotional attachment to it. And when they do finally refer you to someone, like that referral is gonna mean something um, to that person that reads it. Um, I, I recently read a referral letter that was created by someone that built one of those relationships. And I could tell you, I've never seen a more strongly, emotionally driven uh, referral letter. And if I were reading that as a hiring manager, I'd, I'd want to screen, have that individual come and talk to me first thing, because it shows that, that bond, that relationship. So build that relationship, mentoring, give back, You'd be surprised. Um, you, you could feel that you're not really far ahead, that you might not have much value to give, but there's probably someone five steps behind you that you could share what you did to get those five steps ahead that could make all the difference in the world to them. So don't hold back. Don't feel that because you're new to the game that you don't have anything to give. Um, I, I started like that one day and I, I just gave back and by continuing to give back, um, it, 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 it's rewarding. Getting your next role. Well, as you can see, use your network. You, you met a bunch of people. Um, for those transitioning out of the military, you're, you're connecting with individuals across the country. Um, you're expressing what you're looking for. They might be looking for a role too. While they're looking for a role, they could see one that you like. They could be in an interview and go, huh, that's not right for me. But um, Frank over here, I know he loves this. I, I, I might know someone that like Frank, I'll, I'll send him this role and he's gonna love it. So just think about that. Um, as you build these relationships, the just like when you're in the military, like these relationships are gonna last a while and these people can help you get your next role. Um, social engineer. Building relationships, getting to know people, you're going to have to do this with hiring managers. Um, you're going to have to get this to do this with recruiters. What are what are some of the ways that we could build quick rapport with them? Find out about them. Find out about their history. How long have they been at the company? Maybe what city you're from? Um, what are some of the things that they posted on that they really liked? You could touch on some of those subjects during an interview, and that helps build a rapport and helps ease the tension in the interview. And then that makes it more conversational and less confrontational. So um, use those types of social engineering skills as, your, as part of your interview so that 
it could be more of a conversation and less of a confrontation. You, you don't want the interview to be growing. You want to learn about the company. They want to learn about you. But for that to happen, um, the rapport has to be there and the tension has to be gone. Otherwise, it'll just feel like a robotic exchange of information. So um, HR and applicant tracking systems. Many of you know if you've applied for <laughs> a government role, uh, their resumes are long, very detailed. Um, if you're going to the, the private side, it's totally opposite. They, they don't want it long. They don't want it detailed. They, they probably want it less than two pages. Um, but you have to find a way to have that resume market yourself effectively. Your resume, your LinkedIn profile, these are marketing tools for the job you want, not the past that you've had. Uh, let me say that again. It's a marketing tool for the job you want, not the past you had. I mean, it's great that you've been in the military, but if you're looking for a soccer role, I wanna see what you did in the military that makes you feel that you'll be a good SOC analyst. Tell me, tell me what you did. How does that relate to this role? And if you could tell me that you used open source engineering to find out about threat actors in the space that you're operating in and how that related to your mission, huh, well, maybe you could do that to help defend my company. Didn't think about that. So think about what you did and how that relates to the role you want. Um, look at different job descriptions, tailor your, um, your resume to that specific job. That's the best way that you're gonna make it through HR applicant tracking systems. The next best way, social engineer. Talk to a hiring manager, talk to a peer, bypass it. Like talk to a recruiter directly, find out who is involved with the hiring, who's involved with the team, reach out to those individuals, connect to them, build rapport with them. Then you, you don't have to be one in 100 people that are applying for the SOC analyst role, right? You become Frank that gave my resume to that, that gave me your, your resume and I'm gonna tell my boss, Paul, hey, talk to Frank the other day. He's really passionate about um, being, becoming a SOC analyst. He has a great military experience. Um, definitely should talk to him, right? Builds that rapport. Flipping the table. If you're ever responsible for, for becoming a hiring manager, um, make, make the job descriptions human like having a long list of a hundred bullet points. We don't want that. Like explain what you're looking for in a candidate and even ask the, ask the hiring manager, right? Like, what are you looking for? What are your expectations in this role? Be open and inclusive, humanize a process. Like don't make it just a number in a system and communication goes both ways. So I'll share um, this slide deck out with those that are here. Um, but one of the things that I want you to do is write down right now, what are your strengths? What are your five year goals? And you have to connect to at least 10 people that are in here. You have to have three job opportunities. And then I want you to follow up, whether that's on LinkedIn, this discord channel, uh, from Paul and hold your, hold them, have them hold you accountable because we want to help you. And the only way we can help you is to know what you're going towards so we can hold you accountable. So that's your mission for today. Okay. Now I'll open it up to questions. A unique situation where he's already holding the 150 K job, but he wants to pivot towards more of a, a generalized cybersecurity role. Uh, what are some suggestions without pay cut? Um, I mean, generalists have to be able to, to solve some sort of problem set, right? Um, and be able to communicate that value. So what, whether that is being adaptable to different situations, um, being 
really good in a certain type of technology. So cloud technology, but still a generalist in that area. Um, infrastructure technology, but a generalist in that area. Um, I'd figure out like a, a little more narrowed down as a generalist as to what what you're looking to achieve um, when you're looking for a role. So I'm looking at him right now. Hopefully he can hop on. Uh, Daniel, if you're there, please chime in. Um, he's been doing a senior network engineering role for quite some time. So now it's just really, uh, what's the next step? So for, from the networking side of it, um, there's, there's a whole lot of security infrastructure that comes on the networking side, right? Um, if you're looking to specialize in that security infrastructure, that becomes a very easy pivot um, into the security side. Um, if you're looking to lead a team, that could be potentially another opportunity while staying on the non-security side. Um, it, it really depends what you're looking to do. And then Michael has a question. So let's see, currently enrolled at Purdue for a, a BS in information technology and information insurance. Then I will get my master's in cybersecurity. I've already finished the ACI learning for ITIL, A+, NET+, SEC+, CND, and CEH. Uh, I'm now working on the certifications. I'm just plugging away and trying to stay motiv uh, motivated. I have some freelance experience, including building a network for a local business and the go-to guy for friends and family of IT issues. Ah. So, I mean, so, yeah. I, I think it goes back to like my first slide, like what are you passionate about? I, I think that's that's the first thing that you want to focus, right? Um, even if you've gotten all these certifications, um, A plus, Net plus, Security plus, ITIL, like to me that that still doesn't show focus as to what exactly you're looking to do. Like I want I want to hear something like I'm doing all these certs, but I'm interested in developing cloud infrastructure or securing cloud infrastructure or um, helping small, medium-sized companies uh, implement security at their scale. Like some, some sort of problem that you want to solve, like that becomes the, the core aspect of helping you narrow down your search. So for, for example, we have Aaron Franks here on the line. Um, I've had conversations with him and he's looking to lead companies grow grow and mature their security organization. Like that, that's a, a solid problem that he wants to help solve. So like, what's your solid problem? Oh, that you no. want to solve? Right, Christopher, I think you, you put it best in saying that you can't just go looking for a job in cybersecurity or IT as a whole and finding this, you know, the job, the specific role you want, or at least a specific set of roles can narrow down the requirements and you can find out who's actually getting hired for those roles to better suit them yourself. Yep. And this is where, this is where a lot of the, the initiative that I've taken uh, since I've established veterans breaking into IT cybersecurity as a little subsidiary, you know, I, I love to put people over and Renee and uh, Christoph's breaking into cyber. They're obviously the, uh, you know, the stakeholder of it. Uh, they go far beyond the realm that I do. Um, so absolutely, when you look at these roles, um, what I like to do is when I assign homework, uh, I employ everybody in this room to research 10 companies. Those 10 companies where you want to work and then reach out to three people in positions that intrigue you. Now, the goal is you want, obviously, to get 30 connections by the end of the week. The reality is some companies don't afford their employees enough time to be able to socialize. So that could be a positive or negative. Are you looking for a place that's going to be so far spun up that you don't have time for yourself? Uh, are you going to find a place where 
all three people are going to connect to you and they're all going to tell you amazing things about the organization. Um, and then ultimately, you know, who holds the golden nugget of having that internal referral? Uh, you'd be surprised, like don't apply for a job for a company until you at least try to network with somebody there. Um, you know, there's several companies that offer referral bonus, right? Or some companies offer referral bonus plus a sign-on bonus. They exist. Uh, there's going to be the more traditional companies that you don't even hear about. Uh, I was trying to get Disney as a part of our uh, job fair because, believe it or not, Disney holds, oh man, they're, they have... 26 departments in cybersecurity and information assurance. And that's across, you know, everywhere they have a Disney world or Disneyland, you know, Japan, China, you know, you name it. Uh, they need cybersecurity and information assurance. Now, that's where, again, you, you got to target these folks. You really got to see what the skill set is. And this will also help you with identifying the certs. Um, you know, as military members, the first people that we're accustomed to to ask about their jobs are civilian contractors and GS employees. Well, they are held to a standard of the 8570 cybersecurity workforce model, which mandates that as a civilian contractor or GS employee, you have to have XYZ cert to get that job. That's what we're ingrained. That's the institutionalized mindset that we have so the first thing out the door when we separate, retire, transition is, man, I want to find a boot camp so I can go ahead and get this cert and my 180 day, you know, waiver time to hop in the GS position is over. I had to cert, I could start working. But what they're realizing is when you start talking to these companies, you know, like threat intelligence, threat intelligence, you go talk to them or anybody that works in there and they're going to be like, why are you getting security plus? Like it has no value in our company. Uh, and that's the reality. You want to talk to the people that are doing the job and figuring out what they're doing continuous education on. Um, but that's my soapbox for, uh, for that little topic. <laughs> Paul, we got a couple, a couple questions and, and comments come in that I just shot over to you. Um, do you want me to, me to hand you the floor for a second and, and grab some of those? Yeah, I can fill some questions. Here, I, I message them to you and, you know, you and Christoph, however you'd like to take them, but the floor is, the floor is open. Let's see, 41 year, 15 years law enforcement. Frank, I'm guessing this one's you, 41 with 15 years of law enforcement. Can you come off mute? Yes, that's me? me. There he is. Uh, so Frank, um, I mean, you're in a unique situation. We've had a lot of uh, engagements talking. Uh, so, you know, nine of which are criminal investigator, vehicle crime specialists, and looking to pivot into cybersecurity, leaning towards DFIR or pen testing. You are in a prime, a prime level of, of substantial pots of money uh, for the reason that cryptocurrency is still being thought out as how we can do DFIR against it. Uh, quantum, the, the quantum cliff is coming. You know, by 2025, the commercial quantum this you know, processor. Should I be got on mama phone. phone, so I got to figure out. A... <laughs> so my apologies, my apologies. No, you're okay. No, so what, what I would look at is, you know, everything that you've already done. I mean, you have substantial knowledge in evidence collection, preservation of evidence, uh, kill chain, uh, custody, custody transfers, legal representation. These are all the skills that you can bring in and you really, you can really look at it. You know, like what I, what I learned from Christoph was, you know, you have these these soft skills and hard skills that have embedded into you over these last 15 years. You do not have to start entry level. Don't let anybody tell you that. <coughs> and it's talking to you 
you know, the hiring managers of those companies that you're intrigued with to really get their attention. Uh, and that's, that's really what it is. You know, I'm bringing uh, the other Frank onto a clubhouse with me and I'm, I'm challenging him to put his law enforcement into a digital debate uh, platform, you know, to really discuss with CISOs, uh, you know, everybody's scared of the, the executive suite. Do, do not be scared. Reach out to the CISOs for companies. Uh, you know, some companies might see that as, well, you know, Frank, you got 15 years of law enforcement. Um, you know, I have plenty of DFIR and uh, media forensics analysts. How would you feel about coming on as our judge advocate or legal aid for our company? And now you have the ability to land a, you know, a cushy job and use the company's, you know, uh, education uh, reimbursement to further your, you know, what you want to do with the field. To that, I mean, your, your bigger companies are even going to have more like physical security requirements and even for their executives if you could combine your dfir experience with your law enforcement experience you could offer a service at that level where you can help them with their investigations um help them with analyzing threats to their executives and ensuring that um those are not real or whatever help help vetting them as well so don't think just inside the box and this actually aligns with the next question uh, i'm 28 years old and have a, a bachelor's in cybersecurity information systems currently doing my master's in cybersecurity have a sec plus a plus uh, the isc sscp ceh trying to get in blue team side but feeling like falling behind based on my age. Again, this goes back to, you know, marketing yourself to target those companies that have uh, mid to senior level roles that are uh, available. You know, there's 1.8 million cybersecurity roles that can't get filled. What if I told you 38% of that based on uh, a collective conversation with CISOs is mid to senior level roles. You can bring on uh, like your military experience. Like the next question was about air crew, All right? So with your military experience. Well, okay, I have a question about that. Can I ask you a quick? I'm driving. So. Yeah, yeah. So when I apply, it's Frank. So when I apply for those mid-level jobs, like even with the bachelor's degree, they require like five to six years experience. It's like, well, I'm just getting out of college. I don't have that yet. So I have to take the entry level. But my skill set is higher than entry level. So I'm like in this weird bubble. But you you have experience, right? You just have to think about how to frame your experience. Um, look at the job requirements. Look at your work experience. And look at how you've done the things that they've talked about that you're looking for in their, in their candidates in your current role, right? You, you might not have had the title, but you might have done some of those skills and com competencies along the way. So you have the experience. Um, you just have to market yourself in the right way, sell yourself in the right way. And this is also where it, it comes into a battle between do I do a functional resume or chronological resume, right? Because with a functional resume, you can absolutely target yourself with everything that you've learned over the course of your life of how it applies to that position. A chronological resume is the only way they're gonna know that you don't have X amount of years of experience. You know, until you finally get to the panel interview and they ask you, okay, well, how, you know, how many years have you worked with Splunk or something like that? Um, but, you know, it goes back to the same thing that, you know, I've, I'm glad both of the Franks are in here because they're both, they're both killing this. Uh, I did an open challenge and said, hey, you know, I'm glad you're going out to try hack me, uh, the BTL, the hack the box and all these other places and you're posting your badges. But that's just like getting on Twitter or something and you know taking a picture of your food. Expand on it. What did you learn while you earned that badge? What was humbling of it? Because I'm telling you right now, cybersecurity is humbling. 
Uh, there is no clear master in cybersecurity. Technology just moves way too fast for that. Um, and if you have a mentor that's not learning from you, then they're not a mentor. Um, because in this space, you know, one of the biggest drawbacks is, you know, if you identify that you are not a continuous learner, then you might just need to stick with IT. And that's just a sad reality. Um, but that is a mechanism to really push yourself, right? When you're, when you're making this post, you're branding yourself as uh, a, a community contributor. And a lot of organizations love that. Uh, it gives you the ability also to start reaching out to the organizations like ISAC, uh, ISC, ISAEE, and, and places like that to really see if you can volunteer with them. Um, take it a step further, you know, another mentee, I don't know if he's in here, Brad. Um, he asked his professor, you know, hey, uh, you know, do you have any projects that I can help you with? And next thing you know, he's, he's looking at possibly getting a little you know, not a whole lot, but a little side cash to help them with some threat intel research. So now you're actively helping an academic community, you know, build a threat intel package. Um, I know it's a roundabout way to answer uh, the question, Frank. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's so robust. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do with this job fair and while we you know, got together to really build this community is we're trying to get rid of the unicorn job postings. Uh, you know, when it goes back to Daniel, when you talk about that 135, 140K job that you don't want to get, you know, get rid of because you have a cost of living adjustment. That's where I say, look at Cyber SN. Um, you know, Cyber SN is notorious for posting jobs that are in the top dollar amount. Uh, but also, when you're looking for jobs, you got to be worried about the contract, uh, the contract value. Uh, so, you know, you look at a GS employee, you're at a pay scale. Uh, you know, we get accustomed to a certain pay rate. We might want to go start and work with a GS position because it's stable and it's what we know. Uh, we get enti uh, enticed by DOD contractors. So we get pulled on to late, maybe a Lockheed Martin contract. Uh, now that contract has the potential of getting bought out by another contractor, say Spaywar. Well, now Spaywar comes in, they might have the ability to say they don't want to keep you on board. They want to have only Spaywar folk. Uh, or we're going to take this contract over and we're going to split up how we're doing the pay scale. And now your contract has to be renegotiated. Um, and then contracts ultimately disappear. Uh, you know, hopefully Jeremiah Jackson's in the audience. He's a, he's a, a perfect um model of this where he was on a contract and the contract ended and they're like um good luck ask us for a letter of recommendation um, you know it, this is this type of stuff that happens and this is why you have to you know ultimately make um make opportunities for yourself cyber is full of that uh the director of CISA is creating a uh, cyber humans or cyber person officer. And it's based on the same construct that, you know, you hear Gerald Auger, Steven Simorov, Josh Mason, Neil Bridges, Christoph, Renee, Naomi. It's all about the same thing. Let's, let's unify how we're doing this hiring metrics, um, you know, and building the, the whole person construct that, you know, won't have, that won't get into a job and become stale. Um, you know, because the, the argument is, you know, a lot of companies have, um, you know, I was with the company for two years and I'm ready to move. Well, is that a reason because, you know, the company doesn't have buying into you? Or is it because you're no longer, you know, intrigued by the work that you're doing there? Um, you know, this is one of those perfect situations where as a service member, military spouse or veteran, uh, you are accustomed to, you know, changing duty stations every three years. We do it a lot in cybersecurity. You know, I got burned out as a cybersecurity analyst. I'm going to go start to do threat intel. I'm going to just go focus on that. 
but let's see. But the blue team question, going back to a 28 year old, um, in some cases, depending on the MSP, MSSP that you talk to, you absolutely might run into ageism, uh, but you have to embrace it, right? Because you have life experiences that these folks don't have. Um, and, you know, here's where I would say coordinate with people like JJ Davey, uh, you know, who's a veteran that's living over in the UK uh, as a SOC specialist. Uh, people like Josh Copeland, you know, who's a SOC manager. Really talk to them and, and figure out, okay, you know, I want to do blue team, but does that mean that you have to be in a SOC? And the answer might not be no. But are we millionaires in five years? <laughs> <laughs> any tips for a rescue pilot transitioning into cyber currently in the cybersecurity workforce training program uh, for the next six months so you're doing ai and machine learning tom gill can you come off mute yeah off mute thanks so you were a 22 year rescue pilot and you're trying to get into cyber Yep. Have you looked at the NICE framework? The NICE framework? Yeah, the, the CSWF NICE framework? Not yet. All right. So I'm going to post this in the open chat. So when we think about the roles, right, one of the things that I know that Christoph and myself hate hearing is when somebody approaches and say, hey, I want to get into cybersecurity. Great. Which of the 52 roles in cyber and the 14 roles in IT do you want to do? <laughs> right, right, exactly. So well, nice looking at, looking uh, at cloud and, hmm? It's why I was looking at the cloud that interests me the most. So cloud, cloud is interesting the most? Yeah. Uh, the cloud. Uh, defense. I don't know enough to get into it You know, more than that. I've tried looking at companies, but there's a bazillion and to narrow it down, you know, some of them, who knows what, how reputable they are. I'm trying to figure all this out. And it's, you well, know, there's a whole bunch of stuff to look at. Like you said, there's a thousand different paths and it's really hard when you don't know a lot about the world to try and narrow those down. So, so you know aircrafts, right? Yeah. So have you looked at the aircraft companies, see maybe what clouds you're using? A little bit, uh, poked around Boeing and Lockheed some. I mean, Where that, are you that's trying to be located? Way. Huh? Where are you trying to be located? Uh, remotely, uh, right now I'm in Little Rock, where there's not a ton of demand, but this was where it was okay. best to retire to. So I would absolutely try to connect you with somebody like uh, uh, Renee Taylor uh, or JD from AWS. Okay. Uh, and partly because, you know, I'm glad that you're in the, the CWCT but sad that you're not in the AWS Educate. Okay. So something cool that I have personally exploited out of the AWS Educate, uh, because you can do it, is they offer you five to six career paths. And it's free for veterans, military spouses, and transitioning service members. All right. So you knock out your cloud fundamentals, and now you have uh, the option to start your career path for X, Y, Z. Well, you don't close out of your AWS Educate until you finish the last module of each path. So what I did is I went through AWS Educate, got to the last module for each of them and figured out between the five, what, which of them actually intrigued me the most. Uh, right, and okay. then I hit submit and finish that module. And then I asked for my test voucher. I'll definitely look into that. Thank you so much. Um, but I mean, Christoph nailed it, you know, FAA, drones, you know, ITOT, these are traditional critical infrastructures that nobody thinks about for security. Uh, I know CompTIA last year was talking about releasing a uh, drone security certification. So, I mean, it's something to keep on the, uh, the horizon, right? Not, not to mention you still have like um, outside of the manufacturers, you have private charter companies that are looking to um, secure their infrastructure. And if you can help them with understanding how the avionics work, how to secure that, um, 
and and can bridge your your experience what's it up all right thanks so guys take yeah, take your value and add to it don't don't subtract from your value take your value and add to it yeah so as an air crew were you were you subject to just romeo or were you on romeo and sierras i was coast guard we just flew logistics and uh search and rescue so you're and on the so dolphins I flew dolphins for nine years, C 130s for five years. So you already have an in. Uh, what I would suggest is reaching out to uh, let me, I'll track somebody down. Uh, let's definitely connect. Um, okay. So, what a lot of people don't understand is for, for aircraft, they have 4G LTE nodes. That's how they communicate back when you're talking about doing video uh, or not vehicle borne seizures. Uh, seizures. Right, your GoPro is talking to that helo to go back to mothership. That is another entryway you can start thinking of how to leverage your experience. Of you know, I I want to do a proof of concept on this, right? Um, you know, just one of the small mechanisms that you can think of. Yeah, we weren't doing that whenever I was flying sixty five, so that's new, and we didn't have much like that in C one thirty. It was pretty primitive technology in our planes, but uh, good to hear it. It's something worth looking into. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, we got. Well, before we go to the next question, Key, uh, that AWS education, you just got to be a veteran to be free. Just got to be a veteran, mill spouse, or transition service member for it to be free. Uh, now, hey, if you're in up, here, <laughs> yeah, so if you're in here and you're not a mill spouse, veteran, or a service member, then you can start looking at Microsoft Ignite. Uh, so Microsoft Ignite offers monthly courses for free that go across stuff like their Azure 900, Azure 500, um, you know, various free certs that they, they, they hand out. I mean, I'm not going to say they're free. But they usually do like a, a 75 off promo code where you're, you're probably paying $15 for, you know, $100 cert test. Uh, and then save those receipts because that's a write-off. That's an education expense write-off. Nobody thinks about that. Um, so Jesse has a question. Jesse, so about your six interviews, can you, uh, can you come off mute and talk about it? Jesse Azul Onyx. There he is. So let's talk about these six interviews. Jesse, you there? Maybe having some trouble. All right. Well, we're waiting for the mic. Oh, nope. Let's try that again. Can you hear me now? <laughs> there we go. All right. Sorry. I haven't been in Zoom very much since so I reset my computer up because I just moved. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's been a fun week. Uh, anyway, uh, so... I've had, I've had about six interviews last year, uh, starting about January. Uh, one of them for Dracos uh, was ICS stuff. I didn't have any ICS experience, but I decided to uh, do the interview anyway, because <laughs> why not? Uh, uh, they had a whole, they, I, uh, Dracos has a whole bunch of jobs that's been open it up. I don't know, something like another 100 or 160 uh, for the next like few months. They're just really expanded. So if you're looking for a job for Dracos, they are all, they are currently hiring a lot. Uh, but anyway, so outside of that, uh, I ended up doing uh, uh, Trusted Sec, Black Hill Security, um, several others, uh, and all of them were basically you had to start running. Like like we want to hire you right now, and tomorrow you have to start work. Like there was no, it, it, they didn't give me, there was no, no like impression of you get spit up time. It was, 
you know, are you fully qualified? And can we just hand you this project and you go with it? And I'm like, but like I told the guy at Trusted Sec, which um, really nice guy. I was like, but wouldn't there be some type of, uh, at least like, a, you know, a couple of weeks or so for a spin up time? And it was like, no, nope, we have too much work and we're trying to work away. Uh, and that's the other thing I've heard a lot of too lately. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the companies I've talked to is there so much work they can't keep up. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that, that's why when individuals come to me and say they want to break in, figuring out that role ahead of time figuring out what you're passionate about, what you want to do so that you can start getting that experience ahead of time, whether that is volunteering on your own. Like if you know what that trusted sec role was looking for and you could be like, yeah, I've been doing this in my Saracata lab on AWS and I could roll into a customer site tomorrow and replicate this. They would love that answer, right? Because you've already researched what that role is you've been working on those skills and you might not have done it in a customer environment, but you've been doing it. Like that would have been a better answer for them than uh, saying I need spin up time. So well, you, you, you well, want to go to. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, 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 you know, cause I just completed a master's in digital physics last year. I've uh, been doing a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I'm rewriting uh, one open source tool right now. And I've got a, uh, I actually am starting to do some review stuff for Cyber 5W uh, uh, and some other stuff I got that I'm doing right now. Uh, so, and I agree. And it's, it's frustrating because the, the issue with, that I find with, with digital forensics is not having a law enforcement background. It makes it really hard to break into it. And you can't just go to, go to a company and go, oh, I need digital forensics for you. At least I don't think you can. Because uh, a lot of it's, you know, centered around laws and you don't want to get arrested for doing something you're not supposed to, right? I have a lawyer with you. And a lot of these companies basically tell me, you, you know, you can't, you have to, they specifically ask me, do you have client experience? Have you been on a client site? Have you done this? You know, and even with Trusted Sec, when they told me they were using something similar to uh, Kate, I was like, okay, I mean, that's easy. You know, if you're just running, not even say your stuff is just running, say it's the same thing on all these computers. Uh, okay. I mean, if that's all you're doing, but like I said, it's, it's, how you structure the word in is, is a problem. Uh, so <laughs> have, have, you, have you thought of, for example, you look on the news, local community, um, the, the regional hospital in the area had a ransomware or a small business in the area had, had a ransomware attack offer your services. Like that could be a client that you have right. experience with um and you you get to to demonstrate that they they never will ask you if it's been a paying client right um right they're, they're just looking for for experience and you're looking for experience in a non-lab controlled environment yeah uh and, and that's one of the things I, i've got several products in the works but uh as i alluded to earlier i moved i was forced to move uh so i i'm still in that state <laughs> so everything i was working on got put on hold <laughs> I have no idea when I'm getting back to it. <laughs> but you're right. You could do that. I, you know, teaching at local schools and stuff like that. Uh, there's several other stuff that I want to do um, that is more, I mean, I volunteer all the time. I mean, I was a volunteer at the AM initiative, you know, and volunteer work is great. <laughs> so. Uh, yes, yeah. It sounds like you do a lot. And the problem yeah. with doing a lot is that you're not focused, right? Um, well, most of the stuff that I study is on the DFIR. I just volunteer and do a lot of other stuff. Uh, okay. All the so all of the extra stuff I do is all DFIR. The open source tool is actually a DFIR tool that I'm actually rewriting. Uh, and then just like the Cyber Five W is actually a new online resource for DFIR training. So it's everything centered with that. Now volunteer work. If you, if you need help with anything, let me know, because I've done everything from OSA to the FIR to intro to security conferences. <laughs> so. Uh, and have you talked to like some of the, the smaller DFIR companies um, or companies that do uh, data recovery, um, data salvage? Like there's other companies that aren't, that don't do IR that you can get your DFIR experience from um, without, the IR part. Yeah. 
So, correct. Uh, the issue is, is I know uh, Paul had talked to someone, someone was talking about picking out at 50 years, senior. I'm, so I'm also a senior at Virginia, and I pick, pick pretty good money. And as I just happen to move based on my current salary, I can't exactly take a pay cut. So, that's been a challenge as well. Uh, I'm hoping because uh, I, I, I'll retire for the military next year. So, uh, from the guard. So, I'm hoping that's going to help. And, and that's another thing that, that a lot of people don't realize is having retired or former military or retired former like law enforcement on your resume is a difference than just having it uh, be in National Guard because people get really confused on, my, on when I explain my job in the Guard. <laughs> so, so some avenue that I, I would love, you know, Frank or the Franks to really, uh, to really bring home is volunteering with your local police department that don't have a cybersecurity lab. Um, they absolutely love it when somebody can bring in some DFIR experience, uh, especially when they're talking about, uh, you know, a local drug dealer got busted for slinging, you know, two ounces of pot. Let's get his computer and do something with it, right? You can actually absolutely use that as a mechanism to learn how to subpoena, you know, how to subpoena stuff off that computer, right? Because you might get access to that computer and now you want to look at emails. Well, if you want to look at emails, now you have to subpoena the emails, right? When you subpoena the emails, now you got to take it a step further. Where do these emails go in Europe? You know, when you start talking about GRC, you know, so you can really learn a holistic approach to DFIR just by volunteering with you know, a police department that has um, a cybersecurity, you know, organization within. A lot of them is going to be probably your district attorney's office uh, for I, I know for ours it's the 14th district in, in Jacksonville that has a cyber fraud division and you know when I was trying to apply for Dell Secure Works I said hey you know uh, I need to get some experience on uh, ransomware you know would I be able to come in and you know shadow or assist and they absolutely loved it that's extra work that they don't have to do. That's an extra person that they don't have to subpoena or not request from another company outside organization that deals with that. Uh, and then they understand that you're coming in as a volunteer. So you don't have to worry about, you know, the fact that you don't know something. The ability to say that I know 700 people that can answer this question for me and get an answer as long as you can understand the PII and anonymity behind that case, you can ask questions. You can get on Google. Uh, and you as you pointed out in chat. the, yeah, as you pointed out in the chat, it's hard to find unless you know a team. And that's why the first thing I talked about was networking, right? Um, it doesn't have to be on person. And if you're just going to email them, you don't know if that email actually goes anywhere. If anyone's monitoring that email, like, go down to the station, go meet them in person. Like, where do they hang out? Comment on the same threads. I mean, that's how I met Chris Roberts, commenting back and forth on the same threads that they were commenting on. Like, you, you'll, networking will help you get to know the team to get you in there. It's not gonna be quick and done. Um, this is a long-term approach. Now, everybody that's learning DFIR, have, have y'all connected with Harlan Carvey yet? Yes. The man of is a genius. <laughs> he, he's an absolute genius. I'm going to share his profile in the, uh, the chat. Um, and and Paul, he, said, on, the, on, on the volunteering front, um, this kind of goes into two things Christoph talked about as far as getting experience and how you present yourself to hiring managers. If you're out there volunteering and you put fact that you not only got experience but also you know took your own time unpaid to go develop yourself and get that experience it, it paints a good picture of yourself um, while also giving you that experience that they want so another thing to consider is your you know how how the hiring manager or that recruiter pictures you when you give them your resume um, beyond the standard things we think about and you get that letter of recommendation from the the company i mean you know, that, that's that's huge if you look at a 503 to volunteer with that's huge um you know 
One of the other things I want to bring uh, a great gentleman on. Uh, he's a representation of uh, Mr. Tom Moore from With You With Me. Uh, they are hiring 150 military veterans and mill spouses in the United States this year. Um, if you haven't seen the organization, I know it was uh, dropped in a post earlier. Um, they actually have a Discord as well. Uh, they do gaming events where they geek out while they're killing each other and, you know, battlefield or whatever. Uh, but Caleb Walker, if you are still here, can you come off mute? Yeah, I'm here. And that's not me with the uh, the noise in the background. I'm just joking. But uh, yeah, thanks very much for my kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mine are upstairs. Uh, that's uh, don't worry. I got three up there. No, hey everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Caleb it's, uh, from uh, with you with me. We're kind of uh, growing really fast. Uh, so you're going to see probably a lot of us over the next uh, 12 months. Right now, it's free training for veterans, military spouses, and neurodiverse as well. But if you've been checking out our site just recently. Uh, we also are giving uh, training for, for free for 2,000 uh, Afghan, uh, Afghanistan refugees, and we're going to give them jobs as well. Uh, and we're actually looking for Dari and uh, uh, interpreters to help with the, some of the content we have to translate for them as well. Uh, what do we do is we get people hired based on their potential, like, like, what, how, like what their aptitude it is and what their uh, personality is uh, over their experience. And so uh, it's a it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hard struggle to to make the right um, argument, uh, but we're tending to win it more and more. And so now everyone, as you've already been said a bunch of times today, like everyone's looking for cyber data, RPA, cloud, project manager, ex programming experience, Salesforce, ServiceNow. Uh, I, I could keep going, but you get the point. And uh, but they they don't know how to link that like competent skilled talent uh, with the jobs. And so uh, we're helping everyone uh, out there uh, get it. And so who cares about us? Like big companies care about us, governments care about us, uh, systems integrators um, and uh, organizations like um, Accenture, EY, Deloitte. Uh, and so, yeah, we've uh, kind of ex exploded. Uh, I just started it up in, uh, in Canada last year. It was just me. Now we have a hundred people that are working directly for the company. And then because our certifications are certified by ANSI, plus we give like training on all the different platforms for it.